The Honourable Member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I will be sharing my time with the Parliamentary Secretary for Infrastructure, and I am uh, very, very honoured to rise in this debate to outline measures our government is taking to strengthen rail safety and the transportation of dangerous goods in general, and spe specifically to strengthen the standards of railway tank cars. <coughs> it's been said before, and it's worth repeating, Public safety and accident prevention remains this government's priority. It always has been, and it will always be the case. Our government remains committed to the safety of all Canadians, and will take all appropriate action to ensure their safety during the transportation of flammable liquids such as crude oil. Incidents such as the tragedy that occurred in Lac Magantic, Quebec, to the most recent incidents near Gogama, Ontario, reinforce our resolve to develop an appropriate safety regime that will protect all Canadians. Our government has taken many actions to strengthen the safety of railway transportation and the transportation of dangerous goods following the tragic events in Lac Magantic in July 2013 and to address recommendations in the Auditor General of Canada's Fall 2013 report. Since uh, the Lake Magantic train derailment, we initiated regulatory <coughs> measures in order to strengthen tank car, uh, car standards. On April 23, 2014, under the authority of the Transportation of Dangerous Good, uh, Goods Act, Transport Canada issued a protective direction requiring the immediate phase-out of the least, least uh, crash-resistant DOT 111 tank cars from dangerous goods service. Roughly 5,000 uh, tank cars in North America can no longer be used for dangerous goods service in Canada, but can be uh, repurposed to transport non-dangerous goods. On July 2, 2014, Transport Canada published regulations updating the legacy of that 111 uh, tank car standard to require thicker steel, steel half uh, head shield protection and top fitting protection. All newly manufactured tank cars built for dangerous goods service, corrosives and flammable liquids must comply with this minimum standard. The tank car may be a jacketed or unjacketed tank car. Transport Canada also introduced a requirement for proof of classification of dangerous goods. <clears throat> On July 18, 2014, a regulatory proposal that would phase out DOT 111 tank cars and mandate an even more robust tank car standard specifically designed for the transfer of flammable liquids in order to replace the uh, CPC 1232 tank cars. The new class of tank car would include thicker steel and require the tank car to be manufactured as jacketed, thermally insul insulated tank cars, with a full head shield, top fitting protection, and new bottom outlet valve. The proposed requirements would also require CPT C1232 and DOT-111 tank cars to be retrofitted to improve their features and crash resistance. Our government has been working in close collaboration with the US to harmonize the tank car standard and retrofit timelines as much as possible. We are in the final stages of developing standards for the next generation of tank car for the transportation of flammable liquids. This will further reduce the risk of pro uh, product leaks in the event of uh, a derailment. We have expeditiously developed this new proposed tank car design, which would phase out the uh, current DOT-111 and CPC-1232 tank cars for the transport of flammable liquids by rail. The new tank car design would be the most robust tank car for the transportation of flammable liquids. In addition to support the new tank car design, our government will bring forward retrofit requirements to meet the direction on the phase out or retrofit schedule for the highest risk legacy DOT-111 tank cars as announced on April 23rd, 2014. The proposed TC 
117 tanker, formerly referred to as the TC-140, would be the new standard for tanker manufacturers to use for the transport of flammable liquids in packing group 1, 2, and 3, such as crude oil, ethanol, gasoline, diesel, and aviation fuel. Following publication of a final regulation, the TC-117 would replace the current tanker standard, which was published in the Canada Gazette, Part 2, on July 2nd, 2014. <clears throat> Once published, the TC-117 regulation would provide a prescriptive or performance-based retrofit requirements to which all legacy <coughs> DOT-111 and CPC-1232 TP-14877 tankers would be required to meet. The regulation also <coughs> Uh, would also provide a risk-based retrofit timeline or schedule which establishes the type, type of uh, tank car to be used by certain dates for the transport of certain flammable liquids, either by specific name or by packing group. The uh, TC-117 is part of a holistic risk-based approach to enhancing public safety during the transport of flammable liquids by rail. Our government has taken a number of other actions on rail safety. We have introduced new train operation requirements, reduced train speeds, proposed new compensation and liability requirements, increased uh, railway inspections, introduced new classification requirements, required the sharing of dangerous goods, information with uh, municipalities, uh, expanded emergency response assistance plan program to include flammable liquids and we have removed the oldest tank cars from dangerous goods service in Canada. Our government has been uh, open and transparent in our approach to bringing forward a new tank car design. Uh, as evidence of this, anyone can go on Transport Canada website and find out uh, up-to-date information about the uh, tank car standard and timelines associated with retrofitting. Going forward, our government remains committed to working with industry, all levels of government, including Federation of Canadian Municipalities and its National Municipal Rail Safety Working Group, regulatory officials in the United States, and other key stakeholders such as uh, the Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs to examine means of further improving railway safety and the safe transportation of dangerous goods. Thanks in large part to these positive and productive working relationships, we continue to make progress on this important file. To conclude, while Canada has a strong safety regime for railways and the transportation of dangerous goods, our government continues to take action to improve the safety and accountability <coughs> of Canada's railways. We are confident that the actions we have taken in collaboration with our partners will set a stronger standard for the next generation of tank cars used to transport for flammable liquids and by doing so will reduce the chance of leaks in the event of derailment. The actions of our government as, uh, uh, that our government has taken go well beyond a mere response to recent rail incidents. Rather, we seek to assure Canadians that we are doing what needs to be done to strengthen the safety of our railways and the transportation of dangerous goods. These actions demonstrate our belief in the continued use of railway shipping and transportation of dangerous goods and they demonstrate our commitment to the safety and protection of all Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> uh, questions and comments? Question and comment chair, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, rail line safety is uh, an important uh, issue to, to all Canadians. I can tell the member, in terms of representing uh, Winnipeg North, we have uh, the CP yards uh, that uh, go along the southern uh, boundary. It's actually one of our boundary lines, and uh, we know that there's all sorts of uh, uh, cargo uh, that actually is transported uh, through the, the heart of Winnipeg. You have uh, CN, uh, also the Symington Yards out at the other side of the city of Winnipeg. Point is, is that 
Uh, everything kind of goes through Winnipeg before it starts going out to, uh, out west or through Winnipeg coming from the west going going out east. So you know, residents of Manitoba are very much uh, concerned about uh, rail line uh, safety. There's no doubt about it. And there are, there's reason to, to believe through a number of steps, initiatives, that this will improve to a certain degree uh, the whole issue of rail safety. Um, but legislation is one thing. Another issue, of course, is how government chooses to, to invest uh, in our rail lines. And I'm wondering if the member might want to, to talk about the importance of government investing uh, financial resources in particular into uh, the infrastructure of our rail lines. The Honourable Member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I would like to thank the uh, colleague uh, opposite for his questions. And as I indicated in my speech, uh, the rail safety uh, is something that this government is taking very, very seriously. We will have to transport uh, our goods by rail. And rail safety has many components. And of course, we've, to date, we've invested large um, uh, as, uh, sums of money in infrastructure. But I would like to speak about some of the components of safety of our railways. It includes all the components. It includes equipment. I was speaking about uh, tank cars. But also, we have to realize, uh, because some of the members uh, previously were speaking about inspectors or lack of inspectors, there are many technological innovations that have been implemented uh, by the industry. And I will mention some of you. I mean, uh, if, if you remember, many of you probably will remember times where when the train stopped, there was uh, an inspector going and checking the wheels. Well, now uh, uh, this can be do uh, done automatically by electronic devices, uh, devices that would be looking for and, and uh, 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 sending that information to the locomotive for cracked wheels is the same is the same with the uh, 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 rails that need to be ground. Therefore, there are many elements. I don't think I will have time to speak about all of them. Therefore, I'll be looking forward on that. Question and comment, l'honorable député de Trois-Rivières. Merci, Monsieur le Président, et j'ai profité de l'occasion de pouvoir poser une question à un membre du parti ministériel pour revenir sur le fonds de secours aux sinistrés dont la formule de calcul m'échappe encore, ce par quoi on arrive aux 250 millions. Mais ma question plus précise est, n'est-il pas vrai que ce 250 millions-là va être récupéré ou déposé dans les recettes générales du gouvernement? Et si tel est le cas, ça veut donc dire qu'on pourrait potentiellement voir le même type de situation qu'on voit, par exemple, avec les cotisations à l'assurance-emploi, c'est-à-dire que les fonds qui sont déposés dans les recettes générales du gouvernement pourraient être utilisés à d'autres fins que celles pour lesquelles elles ont été perçues. The Honourable Member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, uh, this question was actually partially uh, answered by the Parliamentary Secretary uh, uh, during his uh, uh, question and answer. Uh, and uh, he did mention that uh, as, as far as the liability levels, this is something that can be adjusted going forward. But as uh, the honorable member uh, knows very well, this uh, legislation proposes the establishment of a special fund that would be there uh, to cover uh, also the cost of uh, eventual uh, that associated with uh, trade derailments. Therefore, this is a uh, work in progress. Uh, and uh, I, I think we'll be all looking forward this is the second reading of a bill. Looking forward to the input from uh, all each uh, 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 side of the house to uh, in a debate and then in the uh, uh, at the committee. Therefore, this is something we can work on together and make it better because there's always things can be made better. Thank you very much. 